Hi, everyone. Welcome in. It looks like folks are still joining us here. We have Dr. Abdullah here already, right? Oh, yeah, there you are. I couldn't yes. see the case. Awesome. Well, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Thank you, Allie. Um, welcome, everybody. And so we have a lot to talk through today. I really want to, during our last um, session, we talked about freedom dreaming. Um, hey, Zena. We talked about freedom dreaming. We talked about visioning. Um, and we kind of talked about how do we um, get to systemic level change and figure out our place in this work. And so that's really what we're gonna pick up on for this conversation as we close out Robin Kelly's Freedom Dreams. You know, a lot of what we've read through is what other dreams there are, how people have been freedom dreaming to birth feminism and womanism, black feminism and womanism. How have they been freedom dreaming to birth black approaches to anti-capitalism, right? How have they been freedom dreaming to birth third world approaches to global liberation? And we talked a little bit about that last week when we talked about solidarity with Palestine. And so we're gonna walk through all of those things. But what I'd like to do also is talk about how to make dreams real. And so in the syllabus, it talks about reclaiming our dreams as the conversation that we're gonna have. And I think to refine it just a little bit more is how do we operationalize our dreams? And so that's really gonna be the focus for today's class as we finish talking about Robin Kelly's book or finish um, our inspiration, our formal inspiration from uh, Robin Kelly, um, Robin Kelly's Freedom Dreams. But as always, we wanna make sure that we're grounded in the right space and so you can think about as I pull up um, the slides, who wants to ground us for today? Um, who can help us walk through our land, labor and life acknowledgement? Is there someone who wants to read the first slide for us? I definitely can. That would be great. Um, so if we could first just take in a deep breath through our mouths and exhale. The land that we inhabit is physically situated in the original ancestral homelands of the Tongva people. We pay respect to the Tongva and all indigenous people, past, present, and future and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout their historical diaspora. Thank you. You're welcome. And who can do the next slide? I can. Hi. Um, Allison, I see her pronouns. Um, so again, we'll breathe in, breathe out. We pay homage to those who were stolen from Africa, placed in bondage, falsely named as chattel and forced into labor, who were called slaves, but never submitted as such, who have always been fully human with an unbroken connection to the divine and to each other. We honor our African ancestors for the still unpaid labor, which built what is now the Americas. Thank you. And who can do our last slide? I can. And let's take a deep inhalation and a deep exhalation. To both our indigenous and African forebears, we commit to the continued struggle for liberation and reparations, for it is only through freedom and justice that we truly give honor. Aho. Ashe. Thank you. Thank all of you who um, offered that for us. And we want to remember that we have uh, started a practice of celebrating, of 
lifting up our victories for the week. And so I, I got a lot of them this week. So we're going to um, just show the, my victories, but I want you to think about what your victories are for this week and um, be prepared to um, add on. So Black Lives Matter has been really, really busy this, this last week, um, but also over the last year, which kind of fueled some of these victories that just kind of came last, um, over the last week. One, we forced the police chief, LAPD police chief Michael Moore to withdraw his proposal for 67 million additional dollars to LAPD. Some of you all will remember or have been engaged and you know that LAPD was found to have brutalized and harmed righteous protesters over the last year, beat us with batons, tear gassed us, shot us with rubber bullets. And there were three independent reports around this. Um, initially, LAPD said, yes, you're right, we did do those things. So we need 67 million more dollars to not beat protesters, right? So that we can, you know, there's this guise of training that police always use when you talk in terms of reform. And this actually gets to some of the conversations that we've been having in this class um, and that we'll have moving forward um, for this next hour is that when we talk um, in terms of abolition, it's really important that we lift up this abolitionist frame as a counter to this notion of reform. Unjust systems, fundamentally unjust systems um, cannot reform themselves. And so what they try to push back our, on our abolitionist vision with is this notion of reform that, well, if you just spend more money, then we'll be able to kind of correct a fundamentally unjust system. And we know that not to be true. So with the withdrawal of that $67 million proposal came through both an abolitionist vision, but also the on the ground work, including things that seem tedious sometimes, like sending emails into the police commission, who's absolutely not listening, but is afraid of backlash. And um, I think that that's part of why we won that first victory. Next, we successfully challenged city council to reduce the mayor's budget proposal from a $43 million increase to a $4.4 million decrease to LAPD. And so when we think about those two things combined, that's about $115 million that um, has been reduced to LAPD budget over what was initially proposed. Um, third, um, we held a vigil for Dante Wright's family in Charlotte, North Carolina. You'll remember Dante Wright was killed on April 15th of this year. He was um, shot in his car. He was pulled over um, for supposedly expired tags and an air freshener hanging from his rear view mirror. Um, a lot has been talked about about his family in Minnesota, but the majority of his black family actually lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, and they asked us to help them with a vigil. And so we were able to do that and got a lot of press coverage, which was one of the primary goals. They wanna make sure that we continue to say the name Dante Wright, um, even as the charges that are being um, filed against the murderous police officer, Kim Potter, have been reduced down to second degree manslaughter. They want us to make sure we continue to lift up Dante Wright. Um, number four, we turned out hundreds of folks to a rally in Pasadena for Anthony McLean, um, who was killed last year on August, I believe August 20th, was it August 20th of last year? August 20th of last year by Pasadena police. He was a passenger in a vehicle um, when the police stopped this vehicle and then chased Anthony McLean and shot this father of three in the back. Um, and so we stood with people like um, ben Crump, um, along with the family of George Floyd to demand justice for Anthony McLean, and there'll be more coming up, so please stay tuned. Um, we got Isaac Bryan. Um, he's winning for the 54th Assembly District. Nobody expected him to win. Um, his primary opponent is a woman named Heather Hutt, who's not a terrible person at all but is a very mainstream politician. She was on the staff for Kamala Harris in the US Senate and is running as 
a liberal um, reformist, Isaac Bryan is running as an abolitionist. He was co-chair of the Measure J committee and he's a very young man who came out of the foster care system, um, began doing tremendous work at UCLA around um, million dollar hoods. And now he looks like he may win without even a runoff. And so um, Tyler, who's sitting across the room from me and I are very happy because we spent yesterday afternoon canvassing for Isaac Bryan. And so our, our labor is bearing some fruit, it looks like. Uh, we had our monthly meeting to which all of you were invited. About 150 folks came out um, and we had a great time in the church parking lot, um, making sure that we uh, were as COVID safe as possible, but also talking about why Black Lives Matter says defund the police, not reform the police. And then for my personal victory, even with the travel, I still haven't missed a day of my daily walks in all of 2021. So I am um, encouraging myself because I don't feel like walking today, um, but I'm gonna get it in because today's not gonna be the day that I miss. So that's my victories for the week. What do y'all have for us? Who has a victory to share? Don't let this be a quiet day. Raise tan, uh, Misha. Yeah, I actually see Dot too raising your physical hand if you want to go first and then I can hop in. Uh, thanks, uh, Misha. Um, a week ago today, uh, I was sworn in as the newest uh, commissioner for the Orange County Human Relations Commission. And I've already been to my first commission meeting and over the weekend, I attended a Stop Asian Hate rally that was held in Irvine. Um, the work before me is mind boggling, but I really feel like that uh, in many ways, what I've learned in the last several weeks here will serve me well. And I thank you for that. I did have one question for you, Dr. Abdullah. Sure, Dad. Uh, this going back to your victories uh the money that is now not going to the l uh to the police department where will that go because it would seem to me another victory would be if it was given to certain areas uh of our city that uh really need it so i i'm wondering if you have any idea where the savings will go Sure, so we are pushing in several different areas. So that's the work of People's Budget LA. If you go to peoplesbudgetla.com, it has proposals and we're gonna present our final proposal on um, May 25th, um, our final report on where the people of Los Angeles want our money to go. Um, right now, we're looking at things like housing and mental health as the, um, primary areas that people want it to go. Um, we know that LA City Council has to either approve or reject the mayor's budget proposal by June 1st. So it looks like they're already modifying it. So that's a victory, right? But what do those modifications look like? The final budget has to be adopted by June 30th. So we're pushing, again, housing, mental health resources, um, and more of those details are available on peoplesbudgetla.com. And then we'll present the final report um, a week from yesterday, so May 25th. And you moved on quickly to the question, but we all do want to celebrate you, Dot. So that's great. Um, we really need real strong folks on human relations commissions. A friend of mine, colleague of mine, Chor Swang Yin, I think. I don't know if she's still on the commission, but was on the Orange County Human Relations Commission. So maybe we can figure out how to connect the two of you. She's really a phenomenal um, person. She's the founder of Asian Asian American Studies at Cal State LA and um, does a lot of work in Orange County. Misha, what you got for us? Yeah, um, two, two things. Well. One, I just popped over from the um, Board of Supervisors is doing their county budget open for public comment meeting right now. 
Um, and it was not surprisingly a little brutal, but also there were a ton, a ton of advocates in there really pushing for um, the care first, jail last budget, um, which is very similar to the people's budget, but at the county level, um, just a lot of great folks, I think, really making their opinions heard. So hopefully we have the board vote in our favor, so it can be a really big victory. Um, but I know that there have been so many folks pushing for Measure J and the um, youth justice work and they are just relentless. Um, so they showed up in force today. That's one. And then similar, another budget win. Um, Newsom just released the like May revised state budget. Um, and I work with the young people experiencing housing instability. And he has set aside um, a pretty large investment uh, into transitional housing, about like 8 million, and then um, like 5 million into housing navigator roles, specifically for young people exiting foster care. Um, which to me is a huge win. Youth services seem to always be underfunded. So it's really, really exciting to see that on the governor level, um, the need is being recognized. Absolutely, absolutely, great. Who else has a victory to share? Let's do one more. They don't have to be policy victories. They can be, I got up this morning and I didn't feel like it. <laughs> one more victory. I can I can go. I can share. Or Consuela, do you want to? No, no, no. You, all you, go. We can do both of you. So Chastity, you go first, and then we'll do Consuelo, OK? Um, so I'll be brief. But um, I went to visit some family in Arkansas over the last week. And um, I think all of the learning from this class, as well as other, other learnings that I've engaged in over the past few years, just the interrupting racism, um, different comments, different things happening, conversations, or them asking me questions. And so it was, I was proud of myself for continuing to be engaged and not to even ignore the little things. Um, so that was, I felt really good about that, but it was also exhausting, not exhausting, but it was like, I didn't realize how often you actually have to do that. Um, so it was quite a wake up call in that way. And I said chastity, but it was Allison, unless chastity has something for us. No? Okay, Consuelo. Um, yeah, mine is just a, a small but big personal victory in that I had a very overdue familial communication that I needed to make happen. And it was there was a lot of emotion involved. And you know, sometimes it's just really hard to make that happen. And so I finally got that out of a pen and, 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 and going, which just was, which is just a lot. So it's just a really small thing, but thank God. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And then I saw Chastity unmuting. Did you have something? No, I can share mine um, for later. It probably has more to do with our assignment. So I'll just hold it for the assignment. Okay. Okay. Um, I also wanted to, um, call on who was that who came was it carolyn i believe it was carolyn who came out um last wednesday to the protest are you on carolyn i don't see a carolyn in our participant list. i think that she called in who came out to the protest on wednesday are you on whoever came out No, because she probably knew I was going to call on her. So she said, I'm not coming to class today. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into the meat of it for today. All right, so today is the birthday of El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Minister Malcolm X. Um, and I wanted to just start our conversation as we talk about vision with um, one of the things that's most inspiring to me about Minister Malcolm X is the way in which he completely submitted to this process of constant evolution. So, you know, we know Minister Malcolm X didn't begin as, min as a minister. You know, some people would call him a two-bit hustler, right? And he really submitted to a process when he was incarcerated 
of really opening himself up to stepping into what he understood his purpose as being. And he was really inspired and drawn in by and educated by the Nation of Islam and began kind of the spiritual journey while he was in prison. And as he was released from prison and as he kind of stepped into what that meant on the outside, he became a spokesperson for the Nation of Islam, but continued and continued to search for what does freedom mean? And I think about that in the context of this class, because as we're freedom dreaming, I also think about the, nor the enormous nature of what a study, an eight week study, an eight week course in black power means, right? You're not gonna be able to get to how do we get black power in eight weeks? We're not even gonna really be able to get to um, tightening up our visions or being assured that the vision statements that we generate are the vision statements that we wanna live in in eight weeks, but we can begin that process. And so this is an opening up of a process that should be a lifetime process. And so I think there's no greater person than Minister Malcolm X, al Haj Malik Al-Shabazz to show us to, to be a, um, an illustration of what it means to be in a constant state of evolution. So Minister Malcolm went from two-bit hustler, really an individualistic approach to life, right? The kind of approach to life that we're all told to have, right? Focus on your individual advancement, focus on your individual wealth, your individual success, whatever you see that as being, focus on that. Maybe focus on how the people around you and your immediate family are doing. If you really want to do some good, think about your family. But we're not really taught to or trained to or socialized to see ourselves as part of a collective. And so Malcolm begins life, even though he has parents who are politically aware, he's part of a community that's politically engaged, he kind of succumbs to this dominant notion of individualism. And that dominant notion of individualism is what kind of um, guided his life and um, moved him on a trajectory that would get him imprisoned, right? But then he opens himself up spiritually. And so anybody who's read Alex Haley's um, uh, autobiography of Malcolm X, knows that it was really a spiritual awakening that happened when he was in prison. And he opens up spiritually and that allows him to have some discipline and thought and steps into a vision of black nationalism, right? So when we think about the nation of Islam at the time, the nation of Islam was really kind of a separatist black nationalist movement. And so he kind of um, is, pulled by black nationalism and black nationalism has its place but as he looks around the world um, after he's released he also recognizes that black people in this country are also connected with black people everywhere else and so he emerges steps into pan-africanism right he um, then begins to think about oppressed people globally and starts to kind of take on what people like Robin Kelly would call a third world liberation frame, right? And recognizes that throughout the world, it's capitalism that's keeping all of us oppressed. And so one of my favorite quotes by Minister Malcolm X is that you cannot have capitalism without racism. You cannot have capitalism without racism. And I just wanna take a second to unpack that statement what do you think Minister Malcolm meant when he said you cannot have capitalism without racism? What does that mean? You cannot have capitalism without racism. Um, I think like if you think back to Bacon's rebellion and the construct of whiteness existing so that the people in power could stay in power, 
it's still happening. So I think that's what he means that the capitalism creates people who have and people who don't and racism is used to stratify those groups so that the people that have can keep having. Make that point, underline that point. Racism is used to stratify those folks. What do you mean? To create divisions um, so that the people who have power can maintain it and the people who don't will not be able to get it. And that separation is what keeps the wealth gap, but also what keeps um, oppression going. Right. So capitalism requires um, divisions among the working class because you mentioned Bacon's Rebellion. You don't want poor white folks and black folks and indigenous folks and you know poor folks to all see themselves as aligned. If they see themselves as aligned when there's way more of us than there are of them, then it's easy to overthrow the capitalist class. Yeah. Is that what you're saying, Nicole? Yeah, yeah, that people would come together and then it wouldn't be the same structures that have been in place. So they have to keep capitalism going and make it more and more appealing and get people buying into the lie of it in order to keep mm. groups separate. And that just like the older I get, the more I see that. Even no, even like making people that don't have money want certain signifiers of money. Like it's really wild when yeah. <laughs> it's really wild when you think about it, you're like, what? It doesn't make any sense. And if, you know, I don't like, but then sometimes you'll get countries that are socialist and it's not so perfect. So I don't really know what the answer is, but I definitely think capitalism is the thing that keeps, um, that keeps the pain going, at least late stage capitalism. I would like if there was something called conscious capitalism, but I don't know if that's really real or if it's just like a, a reform that just would actually keep it going anyway. What do you think? <laughs> You're getting us all the way down another road. I love this conversation though, Nicole, it's really good. So stay on for a second because I okay. think that you're really getting to something, right? So there's this lure of capitalism where we're all, even though we're working class people, right? We're not the ownership class. Mm -hmm. We're told just aspire to be the capitalist class, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the lie that we could all be capitalists, right? We could all have all of these things. And so we should be aspiring to that, that rather than aspiring to a system where we all have all of what we need and most of what we want. And some of the stuff that you're talking about, right? The lures of capitalism, right? These, um, yeah. what did you call them? Significators, sig signifiers, signifiers, yeah. signifiers of capitalism, right? Are, are things that are really stupid, right? Like. Why do we need these things, right? Why do you need, you know, a car that costs more than most people's homes, right? Yes. Why should you aspire to that kind of signi signifier, right? Why should you aspire to even the thing like, I kind of walk want a walk-in closet, but why do I need a walk-in <laughs> closet, right? I just to make you buy more shoes, <laughs> right? But when you go wear all those shoes. And by the time you can wear all of those shoes, they're outdated anyway. So you really don't need a closet full of shoes. You really need the number of shoes that you can wear. Yeah. You know, yeah. but we're taught to aspire to these things. I'm in the midst of this with my oldest daughter because she's about to um, head off to college. And I'm like, don't buy anything. Why are you buying anything? You're about to move. You got to leave everything here. If it doesn't fit in the two suitcases, then, you know, oh well, right? Mm -hmm. But remembering that you can leave things behind, you don't need a lot of stuff, right? You don't need a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, do other people have statements about capitalism? Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. Statements about capitalism. You cannot have capitalism without racism. The other thing that I see underneath there is even as you fight for, as we fight for, um, freedom, Black freedom. Black freedom can't happen under this economic system, right? So racialized freedom 
also requires that we fight other systems, including economic systems. Allison, your hand is up. Sorry, there's construction outside my building, so let me know if you can't hear me. Um, but okay, good, thumbs up. Um, I don't know if people have seen, I'm picturing this little like graphic where there's a small fish getting eaten by a slightly larger fish, getting eaten by a slightly, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of head knots. And as a representation of capitalism, um, the only way that you justify having that smallest fish is by dehumanizing some group of people. Mm. Dehumanization is a, found, is a foundation of racism. There's a whole conversation happening in this chat. <laughs> Alessandra, go ahead and say it because my eyes are not that good. So go ahead and say it. Um, the, the CEO, the CEO of, of Whole Foods mm -hmm. wrote this book, really? Yeah, it's called Conscious Capitalism. It's so ironic. Um, Just say real quick why it's ironic. Um, because they're they sold to Amazon. They were anti-BLM. They have so many issues with workers, with farmers. Um, oh my God, it's just, it's mind blowing. Yeah. So there's this book, con so, so the notion of conscious capitalism is BS. Is that the point that you're making? Coming from the CEO of Whole Foods, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> right, right, right. All right, who else has raised hands? I see two other raised hands. I'll, I'll speak now. <laughs> so this Great. is just, and I'm just kind of piggybacking off of what Nicole was saying in terms of the divisiveness that capitalism has to um, breed for it to survive. You know, you mentioned kind of this, um, the, the, um, the carrot, I guess, that's held up in front of the masses to try to attain some goals that capitalism holds. But at the same time, they, they certainly make it seem that that carrot is, there is only one carrot. And, and so for one group to have a piece, another group needs to give up a piece. And that division and um, um, kind of, um, um, I'm sorry, I can't Com remember. competition, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. competition that it breeds between the groups because they're all fighting for this small piece of the pie that that people who have the larger pie will allow them to have is is another part that continues um, capitalism. Right. And it's spiritual. It gets back to this whole like notion of spirituality, right? Like we live in a world of abundance, right? There's there's, we talk about a housing shortage. There's no housing shortage, right? There's more than enough space for people to live, right? There's more than enough food for people to eat. There's more than enough for of everything, right? For us to have all of what we need and most of what we want, but we live under a system that benefits from the notion of scarcity that gets us to compete with each other as you're talking about. Um, and, and feed, you know, it constantly feeds us this notion that there's not enough and there's more than enough. And so that's part of kind of the turn, right? Recognizing there's more than enough for us to have all of what we need and most of what we want. This is not what I plan to talk about, but it, it's, I think, important conversation. Is there anybody else who wants to weigh in on capitalism and racism and the interconnectedness of the two? Okay, so I'm going to move us um, in honoring Malcolm X. You cannot have capitalism without racism. We need to remember that as we move forward today. Last week, we talked about how we build towards freedom, the importance of visioning, building, and celebrating. And I just wanted to remind us of that conversation. Um, and then we talked about freedom dreaming, right? We've been talking about freedom dreaming. We've been talking about our vision statements. What does the world look like, taste like, uh, smell like, feel like? Um, and we had these visions. We painted these visions, right? Of grass and of children laughing and of birds flying and of sun and all of these things. But then how do we make our freedom dreams real? And so some of you have seen this photo on the right before. And you know the story behind these children who are sitting in this circle. And you know the story of this anthropologist 
who went to um, an African village and attempted to um, tempt these children, get these children in a spirit of competition. And what he did is place a basket of fruit at a tree and um, ask the children to race to the tree and said, whoever gets to the tree first wins the basket of fruit, right? And the children, he was, um, he was astonished and kind of bewildered as the children linked arms and ran, ran to the tree together. And when he kind of gained an understanding of what was happening, talked to the children after, they didn't see it as happy, as joy, as a victory to win the basket of fruit because all the other children wouldn't have any fruit. So the joy was all of them sitting in the circle and sharing the fruit and delighting in it together. And so as we talk about freedom dreaming, it's really important that we think about how to make that real. How do we transform systems? How do we think about, well, why are McDonald's workers? You got, you were right, Tyler, yesterday. We shouldn't have gone to McDonald's. I didn't see it until today. Um, uh, why are McDonald's workers on strike, right? Why are they saying don't go to McDonald's, right? Um, what is it that they want? How do we begin to um, unpack what capitalism is? And as we say, capitalism requires racism. And even if people can't agree on capitalism being a fundamentally evil system, that's what I believe. It's a fundamentally evil system. Any system that says that you know, its drive is profit and um, profit comes from the unpaid labor of the workers. That is a fundamentally evil system, I believe. Um, but if we don't agree on that, that's okay. If you believe there's a such thing as conscious capitalism or people used to use the term compassionate capitalism, that's okay. But I think what we can all agree on is that racism is wrong. So if capitalism requires racism, then you gotta do some, some acrobatics to make capitalism make sense, right? So if we say these systems are wrong, these are not the systems we wanna adopt, then how do we begin to build towards new systems? How do we begin to build towards new systems? How do we make our dreams real? It's not enough to just dream, we have to make them real. How do we make them visions that actually manifest while we're awake? And so you all had an assignment um, for today, which was to think about systemic level efforts that you wanna engage in. And we talked about, we all have vision statements, but you were asked to think about a systemic level effort that you want to engage in that you are going to prioritize. And then think about a project level effort that feeds that revisioned system. And I know that that becomes a really difficult thing because in the words of Paul Robeson, the battlefront is everywhere. There is no sheltered rear, which if we unpack that quote, if we unpack that quote, the battlefront is everywhere. How many of you does that resonate with? Does that idea of the battlefront being everywhere, does that resonate with you? Allison's hand is up, that resonates with you. How and why, Allison? Um, after last week's class, you know, I sat with my vision statement and all of these things that I, I see um, or that I crave for our futures, and it's like housing, food, ecology, mental health. I mean, it's like the list just keeps growing. And so I was thinking to myself, where, where can I make an impact? And it's kind of like, you just have to choose the place and put your efforts there for you and then join forces with others who are leading that work. And then the next person chooses their, you know, their focus. So it's like, we're all simultaneously fighting together the you know, the many, many struggles across the board. So I feel like there's no, and that was like one of the discussions I got to, it's like, how do you even prioritize? They're all important. And so it's kind of like, they, 
yeah, it just, it seemed overwhelming, but it's also kind of like, well, where, what's my piece? What's my piece of this puzzle? Um, and where can I direct my energies um, to make an impact? Because it really is everywhere, right? The battlefront really is everywhere. And there are big battles and there are smaller battles. And, you know, we can think about the use of language, um, the shutting out of the arts, right? The housing, we can think about the mental health of our people and the right to mental health, right? Everywhere you turn, there is a struggle to be had. There's a battle to be had. And so it's everywhere, it's everywhere. But I want us to also think about what does that second sentence mean? There is no sheltered rear. There is no sheltered rear. What does that mean to y'all? It seems to me that there's no necessarily safe place to go and sit and make your game plan and figure it out. And, you know, there's really no, no place that is safe from all that is coming upon us and all that's coming upon our people um, to, to sit and figure it. The whole, the whole, the, the land is a battlefield essentially. Absolutely, absolutely. And so there's something to be said for what Allison is saying, and we're actually gonna do a little bit of an exercise, I hope around that as you all talk about, you know, the systemic level change that you all wanna create. Um, and because you pick housing or because you pick youth programs or because you pick education, doesn't mean you get to ignore the environment, right? Um, you have to be engaged and you might not be on the front lines of every single battle, but there is no sheltered rear, right? So I wanted to bury my head in the sand because so just in terms of like diet, right? So I'm pescatarian and I thought that makes me good, right? Because I'm a pescatarian, I only eat fish, right? And then my friends were like, you gotta watch Seaspiracy. I don't know if you all have seen that. Don't watch it if you're not ready. Have you all seen, who's seen Seaspiracy? It's terrible, right? It's terrible. Like I can't eat fish anymore. I've rationalized now that I can eat river fish but I can't eat ocean fish, right? Um, Seaspiracy is about how when you eat fish, you're actually destroying the world very, very rapidly. In fact, much more quickly than you are just by using um, uh, one-time use plastics, right? The, the fishing industry is destroying the world on every single level, right? I don't get to pretend like I didn't see Seaspiracy because I'm like, look, I'm struggling to end, you know, policing. No, I don't get to just be an abolitionist in that space, I have to say, you know what, as much as I love, I love a tuna steak. I love a tuna steak. I can't eat tuna steak no more, right? And so it's really, really important. Who put, did somebody put the Seaspiracy link in the chat? Yes, they did. Sure did, Thank I'm here to Yolanda. ruin it for everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, and so uh, does anybody else want to just quickly weigh in on that, the, the importance of that film? Who saw it? A bunch of people said they saw it. Bianca, what did you think of it? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm still, I'm still processing it. I, I just feel like, I don't know. I just feel like after watching that film, I have a responsibility to do something now because I'm not completely ignorant to what's happening. And a person like me, like I love seafood, like crab legs, shrimp. But when I eat that stuff, I take a second guess. I'm like, wait a minute, like how am I co really contributing to the planet? How, how are we making sure that it's sustainable? Or even when I read labels, or when I read like certain websites or certain recipes, they're like, oh, make sure you eat sustainable seafood. And I'm, but in a film, it said that no seafood is sustainable. So it's like, I don't know. It's, um, I definitely now feel a sense of responsibility because I have more knowledge now. And I think that doesn't just apply with seafood, but it applies with right. so many other things, you know? 
like that's absolutely how, right yeah so that's my two cents yes yes and it's not just about like environmentalism right it's about like you're contributing to the murders of people right there is a whole um kind of system of slavery that is be you're contributing to wars in africa right you're so yeah anyway recognizing it when you recognize things you do have i think that's the profound point that you're making bianca that when you recognize something you have a responsibility to act chastity yeah i was just that made me think you know this morning i was telling my daughter this last year has been a real year of growth for me and she helped a lot with that she just graduated from college she's helped me a lot but i told her sometimes i wish that i had taken the blue pill instead of the red pill at the beginning of all of this because once you see it you can't unsee it you you just see so much injustice around you and so many things that need to change and i you know in some ways you kind of want to go back to being kind of blissfully ignorant of a lot of of a lot of um things and being able to uh distance yourself from it and 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 justify why it it won't harm you or won't harm your family or or you know you are not the target and and so i think just as we learn more as bianca said we we develop a sense of responsibility to really make a change absolutely absolutely and i think that's also what's happened with this moment right when we think about the murder of george floyd and again you know on um monday when we did the demonstration and george floyd's family was there the awakening that's happened around the world because we were in the midst of a pandemic and people couldn't look away as George Floyd's life was stolen requires all of us to do something, requires us to say, no matter what they did, they had to uh, trot out Barack Obama, right? Um, to say that defund the police was a snappy slogan. It's not a snappy slogan or not only a snappy slogan, it's a policy demand right? Um, we have to be willing to say, what does public safety look like in this country if we say we're standing in the name of George Floyd, right? So once you see, once, once things become exposed, you can either long for the blue pill or you can say, well, I didn't take the blue pill. I took the red pill. I saw it. Now what must I do about it? Um, there is a, a Black feminist scholar Michelle Wallace, who says that once you've been awakened, you can only pretend to be asleep. You can only pretend to be asleep, right? So the question is, will we pretend to be asleep or will we recognize that we're awake and then move according to that consciousness, right? Um, so there is no sheltered rear. We have to engage in all of the spaces in which there are battles, but there's sometimes when we're on the front lines and sometimes when we're not, right? When we have to follow other groups and other people's leads, right? And so this is kind of what we're talking about. Um, somebody mentioned puzzles, right? Um, I like to see it as a stained glass window, right? That we have to figure out which piece of stained glass is gonna be us, right? but we're all a part of this window, right? If you take out just one piece of stained glass, the entire window falls. And you have to trust the other pieces that are in the window, right? And we're all kind of propping each other up. And so it's important that we recognize that as we figure out when we're on the front lines of battle and when we are supports for others who are leading the battle, that we are we recognize we're all a part of the same window and so i wanted to go back to here because your assignment um, for today was to talk about the systems that you seek to transform and the way in which you see yourself as doing that so does somebody want to offer what system you are seeking to transform what system are you seeking to transform not reform transform so according to your vision statement, and I want to just um, also say this very quickly, I don't want to run out of time, say very quickly that 
um, your vision helps us to prioritize. Our visions help us to prioritize which piece of stained glass we're going to be, which battle we're going to take the lead on, right? So when you think about all of these visions, all of these freedom dreams that are outlined in the text and freedom dreams, right? You know, if you are a Black Marxist, if you are an African scientific socialist, then your priority might be the economic system, right? If you are someone who's engaged in third world power, then what's happening in Palestine has to be a priority for you, right? And so it doesn't mean that um, Black Marxists or um, African scientific socialists don't care about what's happening in Palestine or that Pan-Africanists don't care about what's happening in Palestine or they don't care about what's happening you know, with the working class or they don't care about um, you know, the Amazon strike, right? They do care, but it just means that what they've chosen to prioritize is aligned with their particular vision. The second thing, which we haven't gotten to yet, but we will next class, is in addition to your vision, the um, objective level is also informed by our gifts, talents, and resources. So it wouldn't have been a good idea for someone like me to be a part of the Black arts movement because I am not artistic right? Um, but it would be a good idea. I know we have a dancer on here, right? For the dancer to be involved in arts liberation, right? And so those um, two things inform the ways in which we prioritize which struggles we're going to take the lead on. So with that, I'd just love to um, open it up to ask folks, what systemic, what systems did you want to take on as a frontline um, struggler for freedom? What systems did you see? Denise. Hello, <clears throat> um, healthcare. I'm really, um, I'm sick of this, our, uh, nurse, nurses are heroes. I'm a nurse, okay, been a nurse for a long time. But this healthcare hero, heroes bullshit really makes me sick. And so, um, what people don't understand, we're, we're systematically closing out people of color into healthcare, especially in nursing. And so one of my pet projects is to dismantle the racism in ad admission criteria for college, especially nursing schools, because nursing schools are impacted, especially for the, um, the CSU plantation. What happens is because they're impacted, then they can make these rules to have students jump through these hoops that really keep um, people of color that are underserved in healthcare out. So, yes, yes, the health and how is that system then tied back to your vision? Because that's the other thing we always have to check in with our vision. How does that tie to your vision? Well, I think we need. Well, to me, if we get more people that look like me into nursing. Um, it will help with the issues that we have because what ha for instance, look at the um, health care for women. Um, we have the worst infant and mortality rate in um, one of the highest in the world. Here we are, you know, we have modern medicine. Why are black men, black women and their babies dying? And they want to say, oh, it's because we're, un we're undereducated. We're, you know, we don't have enough income. That's not true. And I think if you if people understand that they love to put us in a box and call us African American and then do everything and put us all in one box, but we're not one box. We're we we we're pretty um, diverse. You know, we have Asian orient, we have Latinx or, um, orientations that are in our blood, and so that kind of that's why I think why it, it stems back. We need more nurses. You know, you don't see people saying, oh, I want my, my daughter to be a nurse. And you see all these things on, on Instagram and stuff about all these great doctors. What about the nurses? We're the frontline workers. We're the ones that will go into, we'll go anywhere and do anything for healthcare. And that's why I, that's important to me. I'm on so my soapbox. I, I, so. I, I just want to lift up what you're saying. So we hear you, the healthcare industry. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about with more Black nurses is hugely important, especially in this moment, right? Mm -hmm. Because when we talk about not just, you know, 
um, COVID-19, but what I think COVID-19 exposed, um, they talk a lot about uh, um, mistrust and hesitation around the vaccine, but what they're doing with that is putting the onus on Black people. Absolutely. And really, the healthcare industry has proven itself to be untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. So it's actually um, very logical for Black mm -hmm. folks to go, you know what, nah, I'm not getting a vaccine, right? It's, right. I'm not saying that that's what they should say, but mm -hmm. I, well, no, I am saying it's logical. It's logical. Mm -hmm. Look how many times we've been betrayed by right. the healthcare system. And so as you talk about more Black folks in um, frontline spaces, especially nurses, right? Mm -hmm. What you're really doing is saying that there is some understanding of mm -hmm. what happens in Black communities by nurses who are part of those communities. That's an objective level, right? Because right. you can do that. That's a measurable thing. Your vision is that bigger picture thing that doesn't just include the healthcare industry, but mm -hmm. what does your world look like, taste like, feel like, smell like, right? And then how does healthcare um, uh, connect with that, descend from that, right? Um, because also you're going to have other lines that come out of it, education, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, economics, those kinds of things. So you did a really good job of identifying your goal level um, place of engagement, which if you think about that same glass, glass window is the bigger piece, the one that's surrounded by what is that lead that holds the stained glass in? Right? Yeah. So right. you've identified that and then you've identified one of the smaller pieces of glass in there, which is bringing more Black folks into the nursing profession in particular. And all we want to do is make sure that your overall window mm -hmm. um, aligns with that. So we have to constantly recheck our vision and Absolutely. make sure that the work that we're doing aligns with our vision. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Well, and I want to tell you a little story. My um, my son nicknamed me Harriet Tubman of vaccines because what what I did was I um, I'm a nurse, but I'm not in practice. So I just teach. And so I felt guilty about trying to use, you know, getting the vaccine. So I, I, I don't know what made me. My friend said, girl, you better go do it. Because then what if you get called back in? Because I was going to come to L.A., believe it or not, to kind of help. So I was standing in line and this woman was standing there and she's like, oh yeah, I'm a teacher from, um, um, from the Bay Area and I only have three students and I teach online and, and she's getting the vaccine and I'm thinking, but my people are dying. So when I went in, I realized that they don't really check if you're a healthcare worker or if you're a um, first, ex what do you call it, a first uh, responder. So I went in and so when, as soon as I walked out, I signed my son up, my, my, um, my husband up, my daughter up, we told everybody what to do. Just say you're an essential worker. They're never going to check. So I probably got about 25 people vaccinated in Bakersfield. There you go. There you go. So listen, I didn't mean to talk this long. I'm grateful for everybody who contributed to class today. I wanted to um, just quickly, as we get to the closing moments, and thank you for your offering, Denise, um, remind you that there are things that you can do right now um the if, if anybody wants to meet me at three o'clock today is student day in front of um los angeles police protective league as we try to end police associations um we'll be there at three o'clock students from indigenous youth council the black lives matter youth vanguard students deserve palestinian youth movement lots of students um cops off campus from ucla and cal state la We'll all be there. If you have young people that you're picking up from school, bring them. This is for preschool through grad school students. Um, and then everybody who loves students as well. That's today at three o'clock. Um, on tomorrow evening at seven o'clock, we want you to listen to This Is Not A Drill. We're gonna be talking about Black Arts and New Black City, which is the Black Lives Matter exhibit at the Museum of Social Justice that's running every single day from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, at the Museum of Social Justice, which is on Alvera Street right across from Union Station. Here are some quick things that you can do. And number one is something we need you to do right now, um, which is SB2, which is the Kenneth Ross Jr. Police Decertification Bill. Basically what it would do is make sure 
that police who kill people at least have their bag badges and guns snatched. If we can't get them prosecuted, which is really, really difficult to do, we at least don't want them on the streets. Anthony Portentino, who represents Pasadena um, and surrounding areas, is not in favor of this bill. We need to get calls into him. So please just call him. Um, call all three numbers. It'll take you less than two minutes to call three numbers. Call him and say, pass SB2. Um, there's still the People's Budget Survey. We're still trying to fire the chief of police, and then you know where to plug in. On Monday morning, we're, be, we're gonna be having some really important conversations on Move the Crowd, which is the radio show I host every Monday morning. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you. And I hope to see some of you today at three o'clock. I hope that everybody again calls Anthony Portentino and says to pass SB2. You can do that as soon as we get off this call. And then next week, we'll talk about how to assess our resources, gifts, and talents as we move forward and figure out which piece of stained glass we're going to be and how we make our dreams manifest while we're, we're, we're awake, how they become visions, not just dreams. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.